Great to be here. Um, so my job is to make data sovereignty exciting for the next 14 minutes. Uh, so I'll try to have a little bit of humor in this too. So first of all, I think it's important to talk about data sovereignty in the context of, regardless of where you live in the world, you have to think about the data that resides in, in, in your country, right? So data sovereignty is really the premise that data should be subject to the laws and regulations of the country where it's collected and stored, often where you reside, but not always necessarily where you reside, but maybe where your clients reside. Now, there's been a lot of challenges over the last 20 years because the introduction of, of the cloud, I'll say the cloud in general, uh, has obfuscated traditional borders. So it's not always clear where data resides. In fact, many times it's not clear at all where data resides. That affects our ability to interpret data sovereignty. I will say that in my belief, data sovereignty is one of the biggest issues affecting us all today. It's something that we take for granted more often than not, but it is effect, uh, in effect an issue that's gonna affect you, your children, your grandchildren, and the companies you work for. The reason is, data sovereignty is really synonymous with economic opportunity. If you look at what's happening around the world with espionage, uh, whether it's commercial espionage or government level espionage, uh, this is all about turning data into wealth for others. And it's more important than ever that we consider the effects of sovereignty or the lack of sovereignty on our own economic opportunity and how we grow our own country and our own companies. So most of us think that residency and sovereignty are synonymous. So it's an, we're, we'll have to unpack that a little bit. They're really, they're not synonymous. So data residency, which we've all have heard of, refers to where data is physically stored. So I may have data that's sitting in a server in my office that's clearly in the country I live in. I may have data stored somewhere on a cloud. It, I'm told it resides in the country I live in, but it may not. Certainly aspects of that data aren't in the same country. Data sovereignty, on the other hand, is really about the laws and regulations that govern that data. So I can have data in my country where I reside, but it could be managed by someone or a group of organizations or a group of people that reside in other countries that may not have access to my actual data but have access to the infrastructure in which that data resides. That is a sovereignty issue. Yes, it resides in my country, but it actually is accessible by others outside of my country. It is no longer considered sovereign. And you need to understand the difference. We all need to understand the difference because it can be a problem at the worst times. The reason why that's important is, you know, data is really the most valuable resource uh, available on the planet today. If you think about whether it's software that's being developed or patents that are being developed in the pharmaceutical space, just for an example, the six largest organizations on the S&P 500 have a combined market capitalization of over six trillion dollars. At the same time, that those same six companies only 4% of their value is attributed to tangible assets, plants, physical things, right? So that means 96% of the value of that $6 trillion is attributable to an intangible asset, which is typically synonymous with data. The second example that I draw on all the time, unfortunately all the time, is the rise of ransomware or cybersecurity incidents. A week doesn't go by that we don't hear about a company in the media being ransomed, right? Well, these ransoms are tens of millions of dollars, sometimes more than that. Yes, they, everyone attempts to negotiate it down. Some people refuse to pay it. But the reality is the ransoms are a proxy for what the data is worth. So I think it's pretty straightforward that we believe in ourselves that our data is worth a lot of money, and, we, and, and the criminals, the cyber criminals, believe it's worth a lot of money. Uh, so data is really the principal driver of economic growth today. Uh, think about it through two lenses. One is a lot of raw research generates tremendous amounts of data or even advanced research. This data gets converted into innovations, but without the data, we can't innovate. We can't sit in our office every day and imagine something very simple and suddenly, poof, I have the answer. There's always research data. That data is worth money because without it, I couldn't innovate. Now we see the rise of AI, artificial intelligence, and the large volumes of data required to train them. Like we're talking exabytes of data to train these large language models. Well, this data is worth a lot of money, because if you don't have the data, I can't train the models, I can't make them smarter, I can't turn them into economic value for my company or for my country. So we have to look at the consequences of insecurity. You know, unlike tangible assets, uh, it's hard to know when data is stolen. And this is an important fact to think about here. People have used uh, the, the idea that data is the new oil in the past, we've probably all heard that. If I have a barrel of oil in my garage and someone steals it, I no longer have a barrel of oil, and it's very obvious I don't have a barrel of oil. 
if I have a hard drive in my garage and someone makes a copy of it and I come home from the office, the hard drive's still there, but now two people have the data. And it's a good chance 10 people have the data by the end of the day. Now, you don't always necessarily experience that immediately, it, but it may take three years for that data to become, uh, may impact you. But the reality is, it's not a tangible asset. You don't know when it's been stolen. Now, there are a number of reasons why we should all care. I'm just going to focus on a few of them. First of all, privacy. Sovereignty is a has a relationship with privacy because your privacy is driven by the country in which you reside. Not every country has the same privacy laws, the same ability to enforce those privacy laws. And when you assume that sovereignty is in place on your data, but it's actually residing in another country, you've waived the rights to privacy in some respects. Because there are some countries that just don't have laws regarding privacy except for their own citizens. Which, by the way, if you live in one country and your data is sitting in another country, you're not subject to their laws. You don't get the advantage of their privacy laws. A second issue is compliance. More and more organizations and industries are forcing organizations and individual contributors to be compliant to something. As simple as coaching a baseball team at an amateur level or running a multinational organization where you're collecting massive amounts of data, you have compliance items to adhere to. If your data isn't trustworthy, you can't necessarily guarantee compliance and you certainly can't prove that you're compliant. Data security is a broad topic, but in general, if you don't have the strength of the country behind you, it's very hard to enforce uh, data security. You certainly don't have the benefit of the legal courts. And let's face it, most data security breaches start with a criminal act. We don't often think about that, but data law starts with a criminal act. So if your country can't help protect you and prosecute because the data wasn't sovereign, it wasn't retained sovereignty, that's a, pr that's a pressure point. And then, of course, there's the c issue of control. Most people here click on between one and three acceptance buttons a week because you go to use something on the web or you have to use a new application. And I guarantee you, most people don't never read the terms and conditions. I also guarantee you, you waive the rights to the data at least 50% of the time. That doesn't mean the data you put in to, to a particular application is being copied and used somewhere else, but it means they own all of the rights to the derivative work and all the metadata and the analysis. So it's a control issue that's, that we lose. As I mentioned earlier, if the, if the country of where the data is resident, it isn't your country, and the sovereignty has been lost, you don't have any legal protection, or very little legal protection. Data accessibility becomes a big issue, because in some countries uh, where encryption keys are stored, those encryption keys are accessible. And we all think that our data is secured because of our encryption key management. Well, don't believe that to be true. There's also many countries now, a few in particular, that are harvesting data, knowing they can't decrypt it today, but knowing that in five years, with the advent of uh, new advances in technology, whether it's quantum computing or whatever, the, this encryption will be rendered useless. That'll be the time they'll care about the data. And not every piece of data is the same. You don't care about a bank transaction today, or, or sorry, in five years, you care about it today. But there's other data, like health data, I may care about greatly, still in five, 10, 15, 20 years. And then the, the other big issue really is around foreign surveillance. So, You'll notice that in our country, we're seeing more and more people, uh, more and more first responders wearing body-worn cameras or in-car cameras as part of the evidence collection process now from a policing perspective. That's great because it shortens the time required to really, you know, prosecute a case or, you know, throw a case out. But oftentimes, believe it or not, that data is actually under the control of foreign operated companies, foreign interests. So imagine the risk of data being accessible to police organizations outside of your country of origin just because the company that provides the services in your country is actually not from your country. There's a lot of issues at play here, but we can't rely on the courts to sort them out. So there's multiple examples. A great example is the U.S. government uh, at one point in time had a lawsuit with a, a cloud provider and they needed to get data from another country and they literally wrote a new law because the court, the court decided that the data wasn't accessible so the government wrote a new law and we've got issues in the European Union where American companies are trying to uh, protect the interests of Europeans in certain ways, but the European Union has different uh, approaches. And then a great example in Canada where the courts uh, wanted to, dis to restrict the disclosure of events in a court, uh, a, a real proceeding, and you know, a U.S. court w was asked to overrule that. Like, think about the implications of multiple jurisdictions. You know, we've got a situation right now where infrastructure providers, cloud providers, have been trying to convince us for the last 20 years that residency and sovereignty are the same thing. But they're not. 
And then to prove that point, I just one example was last week, one of the cloud providers of American origin announced their first ever sovereign cloud in the European Union. So 20 years of trying to convince us that everything was sovereign in our country because it was really resident, resident is now being you know, really undone by the same cloud providers because they're finally admitting that if a cloud is operated by a person in Southeast Asia, for instance, or in the US, owned by an American company, but delivering services in Europe or Canada or some other country around the world, it's actually not sovereign. So we're starting to see a shift. We're starting to see the admittance that sovereignty and residency aren't the same, but we have a way to go. So why does this matter? If you believe that the shift from traditional tangible economy to an intangible economy right through to now machine learning driven economies are important, this data that we're generating, like for example, in this province, the healthcare data is considered public domain. Well, imagine the risk of that data being used inappropriately for analysis about you know, our, the citizens of this province. That's an important issue to consider uh, because it's gonna drive value. If we can drive down the cost of healthcare by virtue of having great data versus another market where healthcare is, is not necessarily public sector based, that's something to really consider. So what are the challenges? Jurisdictions are blurred. You can capture data in one country, store it in another, process it in a third, utilize it in a fourth, fifth, sixth. Legislation such as, this, as the Cloud Act uh, blurs these lines even more. Two quick examples. The Cloud Act, it's a US-based act uh, that was invoked in 2018. It allows, uh, it made clear that overseas data, so data sitting outside of the US, uh, that puts it beyond the reach of the US government is actually accessible if the data is controlled by an American-based company. So that's just one example. Second example, though, is in China, uh, where they've got the national intelligence law that requires companies and citizens of China to actively support the gathering of intelligence globally, and more importantly, to not disclose the fact that they're doing so, which is also a great little side parameter of the Cloud Act. So two countries both able to grab data outside of their, that native country and use it for reasons or for things we don't necessarily know about. Data breaches have lots of uh, challenges as well. And if you believe what I said earlier about not necessarily having the ability to control your data if it's outside of your country, you can lose faith in institutions. Certainly there's the loss of opportunity. There's the trust of government. It is actually a fact that if data is stolen from a government, we do, as citizens, lose faith in that uh, government. And then, of course, economic damage, which is a slow roll, but does affect us all. So what can you do? There's really three things that you have to think about here. First of all, there's three things you need to know. Where your data really is. Do I actually have a firm line of sight to where it's stored? Or am I being told it's resident, but actually not resident where, where they, I'm told it is? You need to know who you can trust. I'm not suggesting there are people who aren't trying to be trustworthy, but not everyone is as trustworthy as the others. Transparency is a big factor. And you need to know what you're doing to keep your data safe. It's not good enough to say, you know, close your ears or co cover your eyes. You need to know what you're doing to keep your data safe. It has to be an active effort. Then there's some things you need to ask. Every service provider you work with to attest to the, to attest to the, the data sovereignty of what they're providing. It doesn't mean you're going to change service providers. Don't, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not saying change who you work with. I'm just saying get clear line of sight on whether they're actually sovereign or if it's just a matter of where data resides because it's really not about residency, as I said earlier. The second thing is you have to ask your supply chain to commit to the same effort. Remember COVID? We went through this pandemic. You know, lots of supply chain issues on the tangible side, right? Well, the same, issue the same issues exist with data. If I don't know my supply chain and I don't have my suppliers all committing to the same level of transparency regarding data sovereignty, well, they're the weakest link in the supply chain can still be a problem. And then you need to ask your team to share your level of urgency. You're not asking people to change what they're doing. You're asking people to understand there's a sense of urgency to know these things. And the third -ish item is advocacy. It's important to consider the economy you live in, the economy you work in, there are sovereign providers globally that do things, that do great work, identify who they are, and work with them. Not exclusively, don't change what you're doing entirely, but understand that there might be some data sets in your business or in your personal life where you actually care about accessibility uh, from foreign governments or foreign, foreign threat actors. And then from a business perspective, this is a, 
again, a, a long effort, but it's important you establish a robust data governance program. Again, you're not going to change things overnight, but you start with a policy, and then you start enforcing the policy across different aspects of your business life or your the organization you work for or operate. It becomes a, a motion, and it becomes a habit, which is really what's important. You need to be comfortable asking people anytime these questions that I talked about earlier. So, kind of in closing, I'll say this. Data sovereignty matters more than ever. It matters because, especially in an economic downturn, organizations in, in, from foreign markets, governments from foreign markets, they're all interested in driving economic advantage for themselves. It's natural, it's human nature, we all do it. But sovereignty matters more than ever because of this, because we have to build barriers to economic loss, which is ultimately how we're gonna make a great country and grow this great country. And in an age where information's power, it's really about control, right? Control is the key. If you don't have control over the data or others equally have control of your data, that puts it at risk. Thank you. <laughs>